Hello, my name is Brian Poole and I'm Chairman of Crohn's Colitis New Zealand Charitable Trust. In February this year, 2012, two of our trustees, courtesy of Abbott's, to whom we extend sincere thanks, attended in Barcelona, Spain, two conferences. One, the European Federation of Crohn's Colitis Associations, and the other, the European Crohn and Colitis Organisation. We wanted to share the outcomes of these conferences with you, and to do this I call on first Dr John Wyeth, gastroenterologist at Capital Coast District Health Board and specialist in Bowen Hospital to address you on his part of the conference. Dr Wyeth. Good afternoon everybody. Update on inflammatory bowel disease uh, in the ECHO Congress in Barcelona. Now this was the first time that I had attended one of these meetings, and so I suppose a little bit You'll be asking the same question that I was asking myself too. What is ECHO? Well, ECHO's mission is to improve the care of patients with inflammatory bowel disease in all its aspects through international guidelines for practice, education, research and collaboration in the area of inflammatory bowel disease. A grand objective, and they were only established about 10 years ago. But in that time, they certainly have become the largest forum uh, for a specialist in inflammatory bowel disease in the world. As part of that, they do have a number of publications, and I've just put two of them here. There's the, a medical journal, which is the Journal of Crohn's and Colitis, which is very helpful, where latest research is published so people can see uh, what developments and breakthroughs are being made. And there's also a, a newsletter, very similar to what uh, you know, any uh, patient group would have. But the interesting point about ECHO is look at the number of people that have been attending their meetings over the last 10 years. Started off, well, actually, it's not 10 years, it's not even, uh, it's about 6 or 7 years. In 2006, 350 attendees, and then this year in Barcelona, 4,282. It's huge and growing. Uh, one of the dilemmas, though, is one of the concepts of this ECHO meeting is that they want all the specialists in one room to hear the same presentation. So you've got to try and find a venue that fits 4,000 people. So it's not that easy. Now, in my presentation today, I know the first question you're going to ask me. Do we have a cure? And you can guess the answer, no. Do we know the cause? Unfortunately, no. So we still have an ongoing fight to try and understand what is happening with respect to inflammatory bowel disease. Now, <clears throat> this is a picture taken at the Barcelona, Barcelona Olympic Stadium. And you might recognise its structure that's uh, in the middle of the ground there. That is a a giant colon and so there was a, a there was an all day function at the stadium and Barbara will be talking about that later but I just wanted to emphasise that that everyone who was attending the ECHO meeting was aware that we really do have a battle, a fight and as part of that at this year, year's meeting it wasn't just doctors who were attending we had patients and support groups as well I'll go into that in more detail. So how are we going to start to win this race against inflammatory bowel disease? Well, here's me standing on the Olympic track. Not much of a runner nowadays, though believe it or not I was once. How, am I, how are you going to get me across that finish line in a fast time? Well, obviously, you're not going to do it by me doing it by myself. We can do it if we run a relay, if we function as a team, handing on responsibilities to other people so research can be developed, new ideas, new concepts can be taken on board. And one of the concepts of this meeting was we do, we're all given a relay baton. Join the fight against IBD. 
Now, this first one, I'm going to give it to Brian. So, Brian, you're going to, I'm handing to you, so you're going to carry on the race, and hopefully we're going to see a, you know, some progress being made. I've got a few more of these in here, and during the course of my presentation, I'm going to be asking some questions. And if you get it right, you get a baton, okay? So you've got to pay attention now, haven't you? Now, finally I start. An update in inflammatory bowel disease. Now, by the nature of this presentation, where what I've done, you know, there were two and a half days, three days of presentations, and what's called abstracts were presented. So that sometimes they will be a 20-minute or a 15-minute presentation. There's no way that I can present all of that to you. What I've done, I've sort of taken a selection, a potpourri or a smorgasbord of what was presented and showing you here so you can get an idea of where people are pushing the boundaries of care for inflammatory bowel disease. So in the course of this, it's not going to be very much long, probably 20 minutes, 25 minutes I'll be talking. We'll talk about disease score, early detection of inflammatory bowel disease, markers of inflammatory bowel disease activity, some comments about paediatric inflammatory bowel disease, comments about or some observations about different models of care, uh, one comment about supplementary therapy, and a bit of an update on treatment. Now, one of the most important concepts that I picked up at ECHO is outlined in this graph. Years ago, let's say 10 years ago, when if I was treating somebody with inflammatory bowel disease, this is how I'd treat them. Think, what, what am I talking about? Well, you have someone with inflammatory bowel disease, they get an acute relapse or exacerbation, we treat it, and they come back to normal. Another one, we treat it, it comes back to normal. And so on, as time goes on. And that was how we thought of, that's how we thought inflammatory bowel disease operated. Acute, acute relapse, treat, bring back into remission. Except what we were ignoring is each time your gut became inflamed and then was treated, there was some ongoing damage. So there's a cumulative effect over time where the gut is becoming progressively more damaged. I mean, you guys know that. You live with it. But doctors know. We originally were a bit short-sighted and that's how we focused on it. It gets worse. If you have surgery, by definition, removing parts of the gut or altering the anatomy of the gut, that actually increases that damage score again further. I'm not saying that surgery doesn't make you feel better. It does. But if you're looking at the pure physiological role of the gut, if you're cutting bits out of it, that's impairing its function. So... Ten years ago, at this point in time, we would have said to this patient, you're fine. But what we're saying now is, oops, that is actually the amount of damage that we're dealing with. And the key to all this is to not to let that happen. In other words, be much more aggressive back at this point in care so you're not climbing that steady slope of ongoing damage to your gut. Now, as I said, I'm going to be just probably one slide on each of the topics I want to talk about. First one is can we predict development of inflammatory bowel disease? Serological markers or antibodies or whatever you want to call them have been found in the blood of patients with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. We've known this for years, but we've never really found them to be clinically valuable. This study, which I'm uh, presenting here, used a combination of five available markers. So instead of relying on one or two, they used five. And then they used some advanced statistical analysis to see if using these five markers, we could actually predict before patients presented whether they would develop Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. And you say, how, you know, what, how do they find these patients? Well, they used patients from a cohort of patients being followed for other reasons who then, so over time, subsequently developed inflammatory bowel disease. Anyway, bottom line is, 
that they did find that using a combination of antibody tests could predict up to three years in advance that a patient may develop inflammatory bowel disease. The only thing is, when you actually look at the uh, likelihood, you might as well have you know, tossed a coin. So there's still a long way to go. But the thing is, we can get an inkling that someone might be at risk of inflammatory bowel disease by doing some blood screening. This is a long way from being in clinical use. So don't go back to your doctors next week and say, can I have my children tested or whatever? Can't be done at this stage. This is theory. Uh, they did find, though, that these combination antibody tests at one year before actual presentation of disease were more accurate. So the nearer you get to actually having the clinical disease, the more accurate these antibody tests do become. Now, this is a, I think this is a very important point from Brian. <laughs> Make sure you take note here. Uh, we all know that bowel cancer screening in New Zealand is about to start this year. Uh, not here, though. I mean, there are just one or two pilot centres around New Zealand where it's going to happen. Uh, and entry is by having a positive faecal occult blood test. Now, as you know, if you've got colitis, that means your, blood, uh, your bowel can bleed and you would have a positive faecal occult blood test. So, in, th in theory, a bowel cancer screening program based on faecal occult blood testing may well pick up undiagnosed inflammatory bowel disease. And so this is a report from the UK. And sure enough, they found overall 2% of, of the population were positive for faecal occult blood. That's about the same as what you'd expect in most screening programs. It sounds low, but it's enough to make a screening program worthwhile. The colonoscopy was performed in about 1,400 subjects, and of this, 30, 30 people were found to have inflammatory bowel disease. And these were new diagnoses because, what I should have added, if you had inflammatory bowel disease, you, weren't, you didn't take part in the faecal occult blood screening program because of the risk of confounding of, uh, the result. So a bowel cancer screening program, like we're going to start in New Zealand, is going to identify more people who have inflammatory bowel disease. Possibly these are people who have uh, earlier stages of disease, though this wasn't always the case here. Some of these patients had quite advanced or severe disease. Some of these patients who, you know, who were out there in the community just didn't take on board how sick they were. Some of them required infliximab. So it's an interesting point. Now, <clears throat> you may have heard me talk previously or other people talk about fecal calprotectin. Fecal calprotectin is a marker of inflammation which is uh, shed from the lining of the gut if you have active inflammation there. And it can be used, well we're hoping that it can be used, to help assess activity of disease. Uh, now despite what you may have heard, there isn't a lot of evidence out there at the moment. So this is why I've got three or four slides on papers about faecal calprotectin. Now the first one is quite an important concept, I believe, and this is in patients who are, have ulcerative colitis. They're on a fliximab, and all intents and purposes, these people were in remission. They were feeling fine, they didn't have diarrhoea, and so on. And what they did, each month, they did a faecal calprotectin level. And then after 12 months, the bowels were re-examined, and there was a, a term called deep remission. Now, deep remission is a term that's a little bit controversial, but think of it as just no evidence of disease when you do a colonoscopy, no evidence of disease on blood markers, no evidence of disease uh, when you ask a patient about symptoms. So the results showed that patients who were in deep remission for the 12 months before, all their faecal calprotectin levels were well within the normal level. But more importantly, people who had a, re um, a relapse, we could see the faecal calprotectin start to rise three months before they had clinical symptoms. So this raises the question, should we be doing faecal calprotectin on a regular basis to monitor how well you are? However, I mean, not all patients with a relapse did have a rise in faecal, faecal calprotectin. So it's not 100%. There are, there are patients that can fall through the cracks. 
Continuing the theme of uh, looking for markers of disease activity, uh, as I've just alluded to, healing of the gut is the best predictor of a long-term response to therapy. However, it requires colonoscopy. So who wants to have colonoscopy every year or for how many months? So is there a non-invasive way? I've already talked about the possible use of faecal calprotectin. This study was looking at other markers, not faecal calprotectin. And they found that by using what's called the platelet count, that's a component of blood, uh, C-reactive protein level, that's an inflammatory marker in the bloodstream, and the Crohn's disease activity index, particularly if you look at the number of loose and frequent stools that, is, uh, that are reported, that is a very strong predictor of whether somebody is in remission or not. And potentially we could end up doing less colonoscopy if we started using models like this. Okay, so what are the limits of faecal calprotectin? There was a study in paediatric Crohn's disease where patients were, uh, had mild to severe disease. And a couple of points here. Firstly, 45% of this patient group had small bowel disease only. Why am I emphasising that? Well, there is some concern that maybe the faecal calprotectin isn't as accurate for small bowel disease. Maybe it's only for large bowel disease. Anyway, what this study has shown, that the site of the disease did not affect the positivity of results. Patients with only small bowel disease who had active disease had positive faecal calprotectins. Now, more importantly, if you did have active disease, the faecal calprotectin was elevated in 95% of patients. That's quite good. As opposed to if you just used a single marker of a C-reactive protein or a single marker of the other uh, blood test, the ESR, the, the levels of positivity were only in the region of about 86 and 83%. So faecal calprotectin is better at picking up active disease than these blood markers. A very interesting point, though, and it shows you the limitations we've still got. The what's called the PCDAI, the uh, Pediatric Crohn's Disease Activity Index, that's what is meant to tell us how sick a patient is. But there was no correlation between that measurement and the faecal calprotectin. So it shows us we've still got a long way to go before we get accurate markers of how sick someone is when they have active colitis. Now, the, if you're sort of putting all together what I've been saying, I'm obviously telling you that faecal calprotectin, I believe, is going to be important in the future for monitoring Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. But at the moment, the tests are expensive, they are processed in Christchurch, they have to be collected in Wellington, sent to Christchurch, and then we get a result back. There was a presentation of what's called a point of care, that's what POC stands for, faecal uh, test, and it has shown to be reliable. This is not a picture of it, this is a picture of a pregnancy test, by the way, but uh, I did see, it's a very similar uh, apparatus, which is, uh, you know, you just dab a little bit of the faecal material on this, and then you see the result. Uh, and the patient can read it, and one thing I haven't mentioned in my talk today, but one of the most, uh, one, as one presentation I was most impressed with is how they were using modern tools such as an Apple iPad where a patient could record their own data, send it through to the, the clinic, and the clinic would be able to keep an accurate recording of how they were progressing and, you know, once again, have early warning when things were going out of kilter. Now, if patients had access to something like this, Obviously, that's going to improve the ability for these systems to work. OK, have you been keeping up? My first question for that, the next baton. What's this? Yes, the... Which is called Sagrida Familia. There we are. So you're the next one in the relay race. <laughs> that's right. And uh, just as an aside, you realise that the head architect uh, for uh, Basilica de la Sagrada Familia comes from Wellington. Uh, his, uh, his father was a rheumatologist at Wellington Ho at Hutt Hospital, and his son became an architect and his head architect for this project. <clears throat> okay, some brief comments about paediatrics. 
what is the outcome after surgery in paediatric inflammatory bowel disease? Surgery is often considered a predictor of bad outcomes in Crohn's disease in patients particularly presenting with complications. So this was a review of 404 patients aged less than 17 years and there was found that 130 of them required intestinal resection. The points they found is if you have what's called upper, it's called L4, I mean we, the sites of Crohn's disease are L1, 2, 3 and 4 and L4 means upper, upper gut Crohn's disease. Patients with L4 Crohn's disease did worse. Also, as in, they are the ones who needed, were more likely to require biological therapy, more likely to require surgery. However, if they looked at all patients irrespective of site of disease, they found that early surgery, surgery within three years of diagnosis, actually protected patients from complications, but more importantly, these children didn't, you know, they recovered their height and weight growth faster than patients who didn't. So what I'm saying here is surgery is not necessarily bad, particularly in the paediatric age group. You can, by removing the burden of disease, that means that they can get on and eat and drink as, as normal. Now there's a lot of concern about cancer and inflammatory bowel disease, particularly in children because you're saying, well, these, pe these are young kids, they've got the rest of their life ahead of them, and we're giving them powerful drugs. These drugs are affecting their immune system. Uh, what, you know, what's going on? Is there a risk? And, I mean, before I even read out this, I mean, the simple answer is we don't know, but I just want to put this up. We know that there is a rising incidence of inflammatory bowel disease in children, and this was looking at a study in France where just under 700 patients of ch uh, childhood with median age of 11.5 years, and they looked at mortality, in other words, death rates of the children, compared to a similar age group who didn't have inflammatory bowel disease. And there was no difference. So having Crohn's disease as a child means that, you know, it sounds, sounds severe, but the death rates are no different. However, if you look at rates of cancer, rates of cancer are different. The child with inflammatory bowel disease is 2.7 times more likely to get cancer than a child who doesn't have inflammatory bowel disease. Now before you get too panicked about that, if I told you that you had a 1 in 10,000 chance of developing cancer, are you going to be worried? Okay, now if I say, oh no sorry, you're, you're, you've got this condition, your rate of getting cancer is 2 out of 10,000. You're still not going to be worried, are you? but you've got twice the risk. And so when you're looking at figures like this, that's a 2.7 fold greater, it doesn't actually tell you what's called the absolute risk. I don't have those figures, I'm sorry. But what I'm saying is we do know that risk of cancer in children is rare, and two times rare is still rare. But there is a difference. And that difference wasn't just due to drugs, it was also to, due to the disease. So. Just as I say, still a lot of more work to, for us to come to grips with to understand there. <clears throat> now, comment about nurse-led clinics, with Kirsten here, obviously. Uh, and one of the big questions is, I mean, if you talk to doctors, doctors are always worried about nurses looking after clinics. They say, oh, they can't, they aren't as good as us. And it's true. That's what happens. I, I, I don't, I don't say that, do I, Kirsten? No. See, thank you. Yeah, I'll pay. <laughs> But um, seriously, this is one of the reasons that there is a little bit of a slow uptake in getting uh, nursery clinics because they believe that uh, care, the level of care may be not the same, complications may occur or whatever. So this was a study looking at nursery clinics and comparing outcomes. They're looking at sort of some clinical outcomes, uh, such as the feeling of fatigue. You know, do, are we better managing fatigue? Are nurses better at managing fatigue as opposed to doctors? Quality of life for these patients and more importantly, time from relapse of disease to starting treatment. And all of you who have got inflammatory bowel disease know, you know when you're starting to get a relapse and you know how long it is before you get a treat, uh, an appointment with your doctor. Anyway, what they found is that the, uh, there are certainly no adverse effects from being involved in a nurse-led clinic. The, you know, the likelihood of outcomes were the same, except in a nurse-led clinic, you got seen sooner. And that means a lot. I mean, if you're starting treatment sooner, the, you know, the relapse may 
not be so severe. On a similar note, as you know with inflammatory bowel disease, you, things go wrong sometimes and sometimes they go wrong quickly and you end up in the emergency room. It's quite common for patients with inflammatory bowel disease to end up in the emergency room. Do the doctors in the emergency rooms know anything about inflammatory bowel disease? They know about fractures, they know about heart attacks, they know about trauma, but they don't really know anything about inflammatory bowel disease. And so a study in Spain looked at uh, the trial where they did make specialist opinion available in the emergency care room, and they found that they could influence. They, certainly the, amount of, the number of admissions for inflammatory bowel disease dropped because you know, if you're a doctor in ED, emergency department, and you don't know what's going on with a patient, you, the easiest way out is to admit them. And that's cost for the hospital and you know, blocks beds for other conditions. So having a specialist in the emergency department meant that decisions were made quicker and it didn't have an adverse effect. And if you see the bottom line here, one in 75 events required the patient to return to the emergency room, which is, I, I think is pretty good value. So... Something else to consider? Maybe something else to start lobbying on, Brian? <laughs> ah, my next one. All right. Which team is Barcelona? He lost to Chelsea this week and lost to Madrid this morning. Totally. Yep. What's, okay. I've only got one, so I'll give it to you. But who's, who's, it? who's this team? Ronaldo. Who, what team? Real Madrid. Real Madrid? Yep, Phoenix. Good. You pass. <coughs> My son's an absolute fan. Oh, who's that player, by the way? Yeah, Messi. Messi, good. Yes. Uh, so my son's an absolute fan of... Uh, uh, of football and Barcelona. So when I was there, my, the one thing I had to do was buy him a Barcelona shirt. Believe me, he has not taken it off one day. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. On to more traditional stuff that you'll hear me uh, talk about. I just got a few slides here that I want to talk about with respect to anemia. Uh, there was this wasn't actually part of the main program. The, uh, at these meetings, there often will be. Uh, a company, you know, such as Abbott, but this was not Abbott, who will put, who will have an educational symposium about their product. Now, the point here is about prevalence of inflammatory bowel disease in, sorry, prevalence of anemia in inflammatory bowel disease. And if you look at these figures here, just look at the red ones. Don't worry about the other ones. But at diagnosis, you know, about a quarter of patients or suppliers were anemic. And after one year, still 20% were anemic. With Crohn's disease, half of people at diagnosis were anemic. And after one year, 20%. So, I mean, is this right? I mean, this is what, you know, we should be trying to treat people. Why is this happening? And I don't have the answer to that. I, mean, I can give you speculation on why this is. I mean, one of the answers is obviously availability of good treatments. But is it important? Well... I mean, I know, as Barbara will be probably talking about in a minute, about her, the impact survey, you know, what patients complain about is fatigue and the quality of life. And this is a graph. This here, this is showing the level of your haemoglobin. And normal is way up here. Okay? So as soon as you're coming down here, your, your blood count is low and you are anemic. And then this is basically the quality of life score, don't worry about that, but the higher the better. So you can see, I mean, there are lots of dots here, but the general trend is, if you are anemic, you feel lousy. If you're not anemic, you're feeling reasonably well. So there's a bit of a, a slope like that. So in theory, if we can manage anemia, patients might feel better. Now, as you know, most of the time we're using oral iron supplements, tablets. And once again, uh, this is showing the difference. These two lines here, the red is ulcerative colitis and the blue is Crohn's disease. Same up here. Red is ulcerative colitis 
and blue is Crohn's disease. And they're showing what happens over time after somebody is given oral iron. Now, what, is it, what does this graph show? So this is when, when you know, sorry, the black line is healthy controls. Healthy controls or in remission, iron is absorbed. You can see that because you've got a rise in your iron concentration. If you have active disease, you don't get that same rise. You're not absorbing iron. So how are we going to give it? And this is a challenge. At the moment, in New Zealand, we don't have very many other options apart from intravenous. And what this graph is showing is this new compound, ferro ferrocarboxymaltose, which is a new form of iron, which can be given in 15 minutes, has a low uh, risk of getting uh, reactions, and is very effective. And they're comparing it to what's called iron sucrose, which is, we don't often use that, we use iron, um, well, we use a compound called ferrum H. But the problem with ferrum H, it takes four to six hours to give, and it, you can get allergic reactions to it, which can be quite severe. But the point is, using this new compound, the FCM, you're getting a greater increase in haemoglobin than with the existing products. So once again, something to be lobbying for. Okay? You're writing all these down? I am. Good. <laughs> He's good. He's good, Brian. Okay. I think this is my... Yes, it is. It's my last one. Okay. What's this called? If you're struggling, I'll give you a clue. Who wants to take a guess? What's that? Um, what's that structure called? Okay. Yes. Okay. It's called the colon. colon. Yes. <laughs> Barcelona. And that's called the colon. And that's just across the road from it, the hotel colon, where next time I promise I'm going to stay. Okay, not, not, not far to go. Finally, we're moving on to treatment. Um, and a couple of points here I want to emphasise, in fact, three points. Firstly, is individualised treatment. Uh, Look, using infliximab as an example, and Humira and Adalimab is different, uh, but with infliximab, patients lose response, and the rate of loss of response is in the order of about 50%. And there are a number of reasons for this, but the biggest reason is formation of antibodies, and also possibly low levels of the drug. So you're just not getting enough drug into the bloodstream for it to be effective. So this was a study. This is the this was the first phase of a study, the second phase we uh, presented probably in two years' time, where they were just looking at uh, levels of infliximab in the bloodstream of patients. And they found at the enrolment into the study, uh, just about, just under half, 43% of patients did actually have appropriate levels of infliximab. 26% had high levels of infliximab, so therefore they could have their dose reduced. But 22% had low levels and 9% undetectable levels. Now, this is where it gets complex. So they then looked at those group of people who had these low or undetectable levels, and if they had antibodies, they said, well, there's no point in us giving you infliximab because you, the antibodies are going to destroy it. So if they had low levels, didn't have antibodies, they increased the dose. So in theory, Im improving outcomes. Now that's the second part of the study. We don't know what's happened by having this group having their dose reduced, this group having their dose increased. That's the next phase of the study that we need to hear back from. But it does make basic sense. You're going to ask me, why don't we test for infliximab antibodies in New Zealand? The test is simply not available. Uh, and if it was available... It's a very expensive test, and so we're looking for a, uh, some sort of breakthrough in technology to make it more affordable.
cost of anti-TNF therapy. We know that uh, these drugs are expensive. Uh, and, but then again, we also know that there is a high economic burden to society from inflammatory bowel disease because you're not in the workforce. You're not going to school. You can't do what you're meant to be doing. And so this was a study of how anti-TNF therapy has affected the total cost of therapy, which is a big point of interest at the moment. 10,000 patients, two years follow-up, and they found these are the important points here. The total cost of Crohn's disease over three months were 1,700 euro. That's about 3,400 New Zealand dollars. Just double these figures to get New Zealand dollars is probably the best way to do it. And 84% of that was health care and 16% productivity cost. So health care, hospital or drugs. For UC, over three months, cost per patient, 896 euro. 60% was health care, 40% product productivity cost. However, not surprisingly, anti-TNF was the single most expensive resource. For Crohn's disease per patient, just over 1,000 euros, and for ulcerative colitis, about 186. And as always, it's often a small group that costs the most. And 10% of patients uh, accounted for 40% of total health care costs. Now this all sounds horrific, but the other side to this equation is, if by spending this money, we're saving money somewhere else, we're on a winner. And we don't have the answer yet. If it means that these patients can go to work, uh, you know, on these expensive drugs, can go to work, are staying out of hospital, are having less surgery, that's going to tip the balance in favour. And so this is why I say this is a very, um, a lot of work has been looked at in this area at the moment. Now my final comment, in fact I can probably hand over to the back of the room for this. During the conference there was uh, a grand announcement that uh, Abbott has won what European Union approval to use Humira in ulcerative colitis. A big thing, I mean, if, if a drug is not licensed for use in a particular drug, it, it has implications on funding and all sorts of issues. So uh, Humira is now licensed for use, to use uh, in ulcerative colitis. Uh, I haven't got any of the data on its efficacy in ulcerative colitis to show you, but I imagine that'll come when hopefully eventually Humira is licensed in New Zealand for use in ulcerative colitis. I'm not sure how far away that is. No, any, any comment? No? <laughs> Good. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a big, I mean, the issue here is we all know that some people with, with ulcerative colitis do require biological drugs. If they're on infliximab, they're tied to a hospital. Every few weeks they go into the hospital to have an infusion. If they're on Humira, they're in charge at home. Now, two more slides to finish. This, there's always a social program at these functions. And this was where what's called Echo Hearts and Minds was held. Fantastic, beautiful, grand building. And underneath this dome at... Uh, in the evening was where they had the social function. And so you just looked up and you just saw this beautiful mosaic uh, tiles on the roof. It's just incredible, incredible architecture. I could have spent hours just talking about the architecture, but I'll just show you one last bit of Barcelona architecture before I ask for any questions. Thank you. This is uh, Gaudi, by the way. Great. Thank you very much.